in this series, a Science in the News seminar series, for you guys, members of the community, who may or may not have access to scientists at all times. So this is a way for you to get all your questions asked and find out more about the topic. Um, just to give you a little background on our organization, we are a graduate student organization focused on communicating science to the general public and to the greater Boston community. We do this in a number of ways, including this seminar series, but also through a few other event series, like Science by the Pint, where we bring a group of scientists to a bar in Cambridge, and the bulk of the event is where the scientists mingle from table to table and sit down and actually chat with you about their work, about being a scientist, whatever you want. Now, obviously, given that this is at a bar, this is geared toward a more adult audience, but we also enter the classrooms of K through 12 classrooms through our education outreach program. And we do this in a number of ways, whether it's judging science fairs, mentoring students, designing curriculum, or being featured at career days. So if you are a teacher, you're welcome to ask me more at the break. Additionally, we release a bi-weekly newsletter on current science topics that's also written by PhD students, and it usually features something that's a hot topic in the field, but it's written at the level of an intelligent member of the general public like you. So those are our kind of three additional programs in addition to the seminar series, the Science by the Pint Education Outreach and the Science of the News Flash, our newsletter. To find out more about all these events, make sure to give us your email address at the bottom of your survey, and you'll receive updates on all our programs. Before I move on to some more details about our seminar series and tonight's lecture, please take out your cell phones and silence them right now. Uh, there are mics in the ceiling that will pick up any sound, so cell phones are especially bad, and we do film these lectures. For the first time ever this year, we are streaming these lectures live online so that people anywhere can watch them. This is the second week of a trial. Um, this week is by invite only, but starting next week, we'll embed it in our webpage so any of your family and friends in other areas who can't make it here, let them know they can watch these lectures online and they can ask their questions. And if we have time, we will ask, answer them. Okay, so missing tonight is my other co-director, Amy, but I am Tammy. I'm co-director of Science in the News. And before we move on, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So we receive funding from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, specifically the Graduate Student Council, Harvard Medical School, specifically the Division of Medical Sciences and the Office of Communications and External Affairs, the Biomedical Graduate Student Organization here at Harvard Medical School, and also from the Harvard and MIT Coop, the bookstore on campus. So we thank them for that. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to our speakers, who will run tonight's lecture as somewhat of a conversation. They will pause regularly for your questions and take a few at each pause. We have three speakers here tonight, so the talk will be in three segments. The first speaker, after the first two speakers, we will take a short break for you to get some more refreshments, use the restroom, and then reconvene here. And then the third segment will take place. And after that, these speakers will be giving a demonstration on their work uh, and how they do this work. So our three speakers tonight study um, sexual selection, evolution, and behavior, and mating in general, and that's what they're going to talk to you about. So without further ado, I'll turn things over here to Alexis. OK, is my mic working? Excellent. Um. OK, so uh, first I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'm really excited to be able to share a topic with you that I think is incredibly fascinating. And that topic is animal mating systems. And I hope to convince you during this first portion of the talk that there is an incredible diversity of mating behaviors and systems in animals. And um, I hope if you leave here tonight with nothing else, it's an appreciation for how uh, many different ways there are of uh, uh, 
achieving sexual reproduction. So before I continue, I want to just give a, a small warning. The title probably already suggested this, but we will be discussing sex. And if that makes you uncomfortable, you might not want to stay. Um, and more particularly, you might not want to look at the next slide. Um, let's see. OK. So animals have sex in a lot of different ways. And here are just a few of my favorites. Um, but, but sex is all about, when we study it, we want to classify different types of behaviors. And the way that we do this is we say that animals have a mating system. And the mating system is basically just the pattern of mating that happens between males and females within a species. Uh, so how many mates does an individual have on average? And I like to think about this as uh, in this sort of conceptual space where you have the number of uh, of mates that a typical female might have, and then the number of mates that a typical male might have. And the first mating system I'd like to describe is the simplest one. And this is where, basically, uh, you have one male and one female that join efforts in reproduction. So you guys have probably already heard of, of monogamy, but I'm going to talk about a few examples from the animal kingdom. So the first example is the Clark's grebe. Is anyone here a bird watcher? Yeah, we have a few bird watchers. So this is a North American species. You may have seen it before if you go on bird watching trips. And this species, uh, male, uh, one male and one female will form a very strong pair bond. So that's the bond between the male and the female who mate together. And they actually work really hard to maintain this pair bond um, by engaging in some elaborate courtship rituals where both the male and the female will mimic each other's actions. Um, they follow, follow each other back and forth across the water and it culminates in a, a really spectacular display where they race across the surface of the water. And this bond uh, helps individuals stay together over not just a single breeding season, but many breeding seasons throughout their lives. Okay. So this, you guys haven't seen the best part of it, so I'm just going to delay a second until they get to the part where they start racing. And I think it happens any moment here. There it goes. OK, so they, they do this spectacular thing where they run across the surface of the water. And uh, some people have likened this to dancing. And that's a way that humans form and maintain pair bonds. So there's a little bit of a parallel there. Um, but it turns out it's not just charismatic animals like birds that form pair bonds and form monogamous mating systems. There's also scaly, uh, slightly more less lovable creatures, although I study lizards, so I don't think they're less lovable. Uh, this is an Australian skink. It's called a shingleback. Some people also call it a sleepy lizard. And it bears a striking resemblance to a pine cone. And these guys live for 20 to 30 years out in the middle of the desert in central Australia. And they spend most of their time uh, just foraging on their own as solitary individuals. But during the breeding season, uh, one male and one female will find each other. They come back together year after year and find the same animal that they've been breeding with um, for many years. And it seems that their sense of smell is so good that they can actually sniff out their partner from very long distances. They come together, they mate, they reproduce, and then they go their separate ways for the next you know, 11 months of the year. So monogamy is actually not a terribly common mating system. Um, and the next mating system I'm going to talk about is actually an extremely com common one. And this is where one female, uh, a female typically mates with just one male, but males are going to try and mate with many females, if possible. And this is a system that scientists call polygyny. Uh, and this is one of the most common systems in nature. And there are many, many examples. I'm just going to highlight a couple of my favorites. The first is in the elephant seal, which is this um, beautiful marine mammal that you find in mostly in the Pacific Ocean. And the northern elephant seal comes and gathers on beaches in northern California. There's just a couple of beaches where females come in. They give birth to their pups, but before they head back out to sea, they mate. Now, because they gather in just a couple locations, males are able to dominate a portion of the beach. And be by dominating a portion of the beach and being holding a territory, that male then gets to mate with all of the females in that territory. 
So uh, because the stakes are so high, you, as you can imagine, mills have very vicious competitions with each other to control access to the beach. So you can see they, they start without violence. They start by bellowing, and they have this flop of skin that makes, is why they're called the elephant seal, that um, helps them to bellow more loudly. Um, they charge each other, but if that doesn't work in scaring away their rivals, they will actually start fighting. And they have tusks that are concealed by this flap of skin, and they will actually slash at each other with their tusks. And I, I think in some of the shots here, you can see that they actually do real damage to each other. Um, in fact, these fights can sometimes be fatal. But the stakes are high, the winner takes all, and um, the fights continue. Uh, Polygyny is not always a violent enterprise, so sometimes it can just be bizarre. And I love this example. Um, this is the Stewart's Antikinus, and it might look like a mouse, but it's not a mouse. It's from Australia, and it's a marsupial. So it's better to think of it as kind of a very small possum. So in this species, females mate multiple, or, or they are able to survive over multiple years, and they give birth over multiple years, but males focus on trying to mate with as many females as possible to the exclusion of maintaining their health and well-being. So during their one mating season, they actually shut down their immune system completely. Um, they stop investing in maintenance of the body, so they stop putting on weight, they just burn through all their reserves, and as a consequence, they only live for a single season. And just this is not the best picture, but this gives you some idea of what they look like at the end of their breeding season. So, this male on top um, is missing enormous chunks of fur. He's covered in parasites. He's literally at death's door, and yet he continues trying to mate with as many females as possible because this is his one shot. OK, so uh, polygyny is a common system. The opposite of polygyny is what I'll talk about next. And this is where uh, males might mate with only a single female, but females try to mate with multiple males. And this is a system that's known as polyandry. So examples of polyandry are actually somewhat rare in nature, but there are a few well-documented examples, and I'm going to tell you about my favorites. So I'll start with this uh, leafy sea dragon. Has anyone seen a leafy sea dragon before? A few people? Cool. Yeah, they're beautiful animals and very strange looking. They blend in with the kelp where they live. <coughs> they're related to seahorses, and you might be able to see a bit of a seahorse silhouette here. And I'll just go ahead to the video. But keep telling you about them. So in this species, what happens is that males actually have a pouch, an egg pouch. And they carry, so females will go around and, and find males, and they have an ovipositor, so something that they use to lay their eggs. And if they can convince a male, they will lay their eggs in the male's pouch. And then the male has sort of an equivalent of pregnancy, where he carries those eggs around, he protects them from predators, he uh, keeps them warm until they hatch and they swim away. So in this system, males can only you know, carry the eggs from one female, so they, they tend to mate just once. But females can lay a lot of eggs. So if they're able to find multiple males who will carry their eggs, they will. And this is also the case for, for many types of seahorses. Um, this male, you can see some of the eggs that he's carrying sort of overflowing um, in this video clip. Another example of polyandry <coughs> can be seen in spiders. OK, so some of you may have noticed when I talked about elephant seals that the males are much larger than the females. They're enormous. In fact, they can weigh 10 times as much as a female. The opposite is actually true in spiders. The females are much larger than the males. OK, so does anyone want to guess why this means males mate just once? Yes, I'm hearing some of the right answer. So males often get eaten by females after mating. and. Um, we, again, have video. I'm a big proponent of video. So what you can see in this video is, let's see. You can see this, this small male is um, circling the enormous female. And very cautiously, very slowly, he's trying to get closer to the middle of the web where the female is sitting. And you know he's, he's circling, and then he um, actually cuts away some of the web and tries to drop down in the empty space that he's created. And this goes on for actually quite a long time. I won't show you the whole thing. But I'll tell you how the story ends. He winds up actually getting to the female. They mate. And then as soon as he's done, boom, she grabs him. 
she wraps them in silk, and she sets them aside as a snack for later. So that male gets no more chances. He, he gets to mate once. The female, on the other hand, um, wants to mate more than once because that means she's more well-fed. Every, every male is an additional snack. OK, and a final example of polyandry that I'd like to discuss is the deep sea anglerfish. And I don't know how many of you have seen these guys before. They're very strange looking, very crazy deep sea organisms <coughs> that um, occasionally fishermen pull up in their nets. And it, it happened that um, fishermen would pull these up in their nets and they would turn them over to scientists who thought they were bizarre. And scientists thought, hey, this is strange. We're never finding any males. They're all females. And all the females have a lot of parasites. They have these sort of parasites on them. And what they eventually discovered is that those parasites are the males. So males are extremely small relative to females, as you can see here. And basically, they don't even have a digestive tract. They just have a very good sense of smell. So down in the deep ocean, um, where the visual cues don't work very well, they find females by smell. And when they find a female, they latch on. And they actually release an enzyme that dissolves the female skin and the skin off their lips and they actually fuse their bloodstream with that of the female. And what happens next is really crazy. Um, they, their body actually starts to atrophy. So first they lose all their internal organs. Um, next they lose their eyes. And finally their brain just, like, just atrophies. And finally there's nothing left but a pair of gonads in this little body that's stuck to the female. And um, the, the female releases hormones that stimulate the male to release sperm into her bloodstream, which then migrates to fertilize her eggs. Now, what's interesting about this system, one of the, there's so many interesting things. <laughs> one of the interesting things about this system is that oftentimes when you pull these guys up in nets, you'll find that a female has many males stuck to her. So um, she has many mates, but each, each male has chosen to just latch onto a single female. And there's some thinking about why this might be the case, and Emily will tell you a little bit about that later. But partly, just as a hint, it might just be so hard to find females in the deep sea that once you find one, it makes more sense to stick with her than it does to keep searching for additional females. OK, so uh, there's only one quadrant that's still empty, and you guys probably know it's coming. This is a system where males and females both mate with multiple partners. And we call this promiscuity. And promiscuity um, actually was thought to be somewhat rare in nature. But in recent years, with the use of genetic tools, people have discovered that it's far more common than we used to think. And I'll start with an example um, of a, a bird that some people might have thought had this lovely, monogamous, romantic type relationship, the eastern bluebird. And again, this is a bird you guys might have seen in the general area. So, Bluebirds, a male and a female, form what appears to be a stable pair bond. They build a nest together, the female lays eggs, and then the male and the female both tend to the eggs. They keep them warm, they feed the offspring when they hatch, um, and it just looks like a perfectly happy family. What happened was, when genetic tools became available to test paternity of, of the nestlings, scientists found that that male who's tending the nest is actually not the father of a lot of the offspring in the nest. Somehow, the female is finding opportunities to mate with other males from the population. And so the, the nestlings in the nest are a mixture from different fathers. And likewise, the male is going out and mating with other females. And so he's leaving nestlings in lots of nests in the population. So this is a system that we would refer to as being uh, socially monogamous, but genetically promiscuous. The mating behavior is promiscuous. OK, I have one final example, and I know what everyone here is hoping to hear about. OK, this is hermaphrodites. What rules do they follow? I'll tell you about just one example, which is the banana slug. Has anyone seen a banana slug in nature? Yeah, they're gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> love them. Banana slugs are for hermaphrodites, and this means that they have both functioning male and female um, reproductive organs. And when banana slugs have sex, both animals are playing both the male role and the female role at the same time. So each, each slug has a penis, and they're depositing sperm in the, um, the other slug's female parts. Um, so this creates a certain amount of uh, conflict between animals, because 
as you know, sort of their male half is thinking, hey, if I could mate with this other slug, and then this other slug never made it again, I would get to be the father of all of that slug's offspring. Right? It, you know, if you can somehow make sure your mate never mates again, you win. And uh, this has led to a very bizarre behavior where after mating, slugs will actually try and chew off their partner's penis. <laughs> if they succeed, their partner is then functionally female, and no other slug will um, stoop to mating with them in the future. So basically, they've been, they no longer get to mate. And I have video of this too. <laughs> Okay, so this is time lapse, so you can see it's moving rather quickly. The slug on top is chewing the penis off of the slug on the bottom. You can sort of uh, see that this thing, that's the slug penis, and it's gnawing away, and if you continue watching, it, you know, eventually this is not going to end well for the slug on the bottom. Um, there, it's, it snapped. The slug on the bottom is now functionally female and won't be able to mate again in wild populations. So hermaphrodites have mating systems too, and they can be very wild and wacky. Okay, so I've gone over several different types of mating systems, and these are sort of the four broad categories that biologists talk about when they talk about mating systems. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah? Why after having their penis or its penis uh and chewed off. Why would it become uh, sexually undesirable? It would just yeah, it's, uh, so the question is why would um, a slug who's had its penis chewed off be undesirable as a partner to other slugs? And it turns out that in slugs, unlike in some other animals, um, it's both slugs want to be both the, want to receive sperm in return for the sperm that they donate. So sperm is actually costly to produce for the slugs. Eggs are also costly, and so if there's no reciprocity, um, it's it's a, a bum deal, I guess. Uh, yes. What's the relative frequency of the four types, and is there any rhyme or reason based on uh, um, the environment and the species involved? Yes, that's a great question, and that'll actually be the focus of the second part of our talk. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question is, what's the relative frequency of these four types of mating system? And um, do, we, do we understand why some are more common than others? And I'll just say that uh, polygyny is the most common of the mating systems, and polyandry is the most rare. Um, promiscuity is probably the second most common. Um, and Emily will tell you a little bit about how the environment can drive uh, natural selection and evolution of the different mating system types. You can probably, yeah. yeah. Based on what central to what you said, is it intelligent to conclude that uh, Komuta Maori exists in animal kingdoms too? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Central to what you said, is it intelligent to conclude that Komuta Maori exists in the animal kingdom too? Commuter marriage. Yes, that they don't live together for a reasonable period of time, they just need when it's mutual and convenient for them. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the question is, is it reasonable to conclude based on this that animals have what could be termed a commuter marriage, where they don't necessarily live together, um, but they do come together to mate and reproduce? So that would be the case, for example, with the shingleback lizards that I brought up, where they spend most of their time alone, um, but they always come back to the same partner for reproduction. And, and there are a few other examples like that. Another follow-up question is, is sexuality exists in animal kingdom too? Uh, there was an animal, yes. a male animal on top of another male animal. Yes. Can it be inferred that homosexuality exists in animal kingdom too? Yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, does homosexuality occur in the animal kingdom too? And um, also, with specific reference to the first slide where I have the three deer piled up on each other, um, in that case, it's probably, you know, I don't, I don't actually know what's going on there. It's just kind of a strange, <laughs> just kind of a strange situation. But in fact, uh, homosexual behavior is very common in the animal kingdom. And it's a, sort of an open question for scientists about why that happens. It doesn't, um, you might think that uh, homosexual reproduction doesn't typically lead to offspring, so perhaps selection should act against it. Um, but in fact, it is relatively common. And there's a few theories about this, why, why this might be the case. So one theory might be that um, 
an individual, rather than having offspring of their own, is increasing their inclusive fitness by helping close relatives to raise their offspring, so brothers and sisters generally. Um, another theory might be that, you know, it's, uh, Emily was telling me about a really cool study with albatrosses. So albatrosses form these pair bonds and they raise offspring together. And people assumed for a long time that these were male-female pairs. And what they discovered when they started, again, using genetics to, to look at these pairs is that a lot of times females are forming pairs with other females to raise their offspring. Um, so it looks like perhaps in that case, um, you know, it takes two birds to raise a chick and it makes sense to cooperate with a partner irregardless of what the sex of the partner is. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, natural selection and I just was brought up a couple times in my answers here that um, natural selection is an important force in driving the evolution of different mating systems. So most of you have probably heard of natural selection and you might have heard it called survival of the fittest. And I want you to leave here today knowing that it's not about survival and it's also not about fitness. Um, at least in the term, term of fitness that we typically think of which is being you know, in really good shape. So uh, natural selection is all about leaving more offspring. And if survival is good, but only if it helps you leave more offspring. So you could live to be, you know, 103, but if you don't reproduce, from an evolutionary perspective, you're a dead end. Your genes don't go on. Um, so fitness, again, is determ determined in terms of reproductive success. So being strong and fast and in good shape probably makes a difference, but not necessarily. It doesn't mean you're necessarily a winner. And just to give you the technical definition of fitness, um, it's the number of descendants an individual contributes to future generations. And I just want to briefly illustrate this with a couple of um, examples. So you might imagine, you know, a bird that has two offspring, and these guys each have two offspring. So, you know, the bird's not doing badly. It has four grandchildren. But then if you compare it with another bird that has four offspring, if each of these has four offspring, what you wind up with is a fourfold difference in the total number of descendants by the second generation. So clearly this animal has much higher fitness in the evolutionary sense. But actually, uh, it's not just quantity that matters. So having more babies isn't the only goal. You also want to have high quality babies. So you could imagine, you know, this parent has only two offspring, but feeds the offspring really well, raises them to be healthy adults, Whereas this parent has four offspring, but doesn't actually take very good care of them. Some of them die of disease. The ones that live aren't especially healthy. And in, in, uh, as a consequence, um, this individual might have more offspring, but might actually wind up with fewer grandchildren because this guy was focusing on quantity, not quality. Okay, so what does all this have to do with the mating system? So the concept of fitness is really fundamental to understanding how natural selection and evolution shape animal populations. And uh, understanding how mating is related to fitness is really critical to looking at how different mating systems evolve. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to focus just on the case of polygyny, which is the most common mating system by far. But Emily will talk a little bit about the others in a moment. Okay, so I'm going to describe an experiment that was done to see whether having more mates means having more babies. And this is a classic experiment that was done in the 40s by John A. Bateman using this lovely animal, the fruit fly. And many of you are probably familiar with the fruit fly. It's an extremely important model system in the study of biology. Uh, you probably also occasionally have them show up in your kitchen if you leave fruit out too long. Um, they're extremely easy to raise in captivity and they have lots of interesting mutations, which makes them a great system for studying this stuff. So in order to answer the question, do more mates equal more babies, Bateman uh, put a bunch of fruit flies together. And so he put you know, a handful of females in a tube with a handful of males. Now each of these males had a distinctive mutation that made him stand out. And I've represented these as four different colors, but in fact, in the actual flies, that's not what it looks like. It's just sort of a simplification. So he put them together, he let them hang out for a day or two, let them mate, and then he separated the females each into her own vial. And she laid her eggs, her eggs hatched, and then he went back and counted how many babies each male had and each female had. And he was able to infer how many mates they had based on the mutations. So for a female, um, 
Say she gives birth to two babies that are red and two babies that are yellow. Her total number of babies is four, and you can infer that she mated with two males because one of them must have been red and one must have been normal. Now you can answer the same question using males. So if you were to focus on the red male, you might say, in total among all females, there were seven red babies. And those seven red babies came from three mothers. So that male must have mated with three females. OK, then you just basically plot the results. Number of mates versus number of babies. So probably everyone can agree that if you have zero mates, you have zero babies. Um, do you guys, who thinks that having more mates leads to having more babies in males? <laughs> okay, so it turns out for males at least, there's actually a very strong linear correlation between how many mates you have and how many babies you have. Each additional mate that a male ha adds basically increases uh, the number of total babies he has. What about for females? Who thinks it'll be the same? Maybe. So it turns out for females, actually having more mates doesn't make much of a difference. And this seems to be because females have a certain set number of eggs. One male is enough to fertilize all those eggs. And if you start adding additional males, well, she, it doesn't mean that she makes more eggs. At least, you know, there are always exceptions and caveats. But in general, she can't have more babies from having more mates. Do you guys think this is the case in humans? Okay, just to, to follow up on that, what do you think is the maximum number of children any human male has ever had? Okay, raise your hand if you think it's over 100. Okay, um, raise your hand if you think it's over 300. Raise your hand if you think it's over 500. Okay. The maximum number of babies that any human male has had is 867. This was by a Moroccan prince, um, and I think we can all assume, and we actually know based on the records, that this was not just with one woman. There were many women involved. <laughs> um, in contrast, what do you think is the maximum number of babies ever uh, mothered by a single woman? Does anyone think it's over 100? Uh, anyone think it's over 50? Maybe, maybe over 50? Okay, how about over 30? Few people think it's over 30. Okay, turns out there was this crazy woman, uh, the wife of a Russian diplomat whose first name is lost to history, and she was able to have 69 children in her life. Uh, this was during the 1600s. Now, I, I should say, this is not something a normal woman could do. Uh, Ms. Vasiliev um, gave birth to several sets of twins, triplets, and quadruplets. So um, her, this large number of uh, babies doesn't necessarily mean 69 pregnancies. In fact, it was more like 30 pregnancies. Yeah? OK, so for Ms. Vasiliev, actually, um, all but two of her offspring live to adulthood. Yeah. it's. Pretty wild. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I think I think most of us can agree that this is more than most human women could could accomplish. And yet, even in this exceptional case, uh, Ismail Ibn Sharif still outperformed her by an order of magnitude. That's a pretty big difference. Yeah. I thought I had read somewhere that uh, Genghis Khan had uh, you could find ten his DNA in ten percent of the population of Central Asia. That's probably a lot more than it's existed. Yes, he may have, but there aren't good historical records. So I'm just talking about cases that are recorded. And I have some problems with that research, but we can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so just to sum up, I, what I want you to take out of this graph, which will appear again in, in the talk, is that the relationship between fitness, or number of babies, and number of mates is different for males and for females. And this can explain some of the things about mating systems that we find. Um, and that'll be what Emily tells you next. So just to summarize, what have I told you? There are four basic types of mating systems found among animals. Fitness and is the sort of key concept to understanding how natural selection has driven the evolution of these different mating systems. 
And the relationship between fitness and mating is different for males and females. And with that, I would like to ask if there's any questions before Emily takes over. Yes. In reference to your graph, uh, is Mrs. Vasiliev's, uh, are, are her offspring all from the same male? Yes. Not? Yes. Uh, yes, sorry. The question is. the number of mates, so maybe, maybe on that graph she doesn't quite belong, but you did make your point. Right. So the question is for Ms. Vasiliev. Um, I put her over here, but she actually only had one mate. Uh, she had all these children with her husband, at least as far as the records show. So she would actually belong here. She would be like, at that point. Maybe one more question? Yeah. Is it intelligent to equate fitness with intergenerational equity? Is it intelligent to relate fitness to? With fitness, with intergenerational equity. Um, so it makes, so sometimes actually you have to, so the question is, uh, is it fair to equate fitness with looking at intergenerational effects? Yeah. And um, so actually sometimes it's very important to consider more than one generation when you look at fitness because an animal that has more babies in the first generation might have fewer grandchildren if those babies are low quality. Um, and so in terms of maximizing your fitness, it's really not just that first generation that matters. Sometimes you have to look the second or even the third generation to start seeing the fitness effects of an individual's behavior. If that, does that answer your question? Are they self-same and is it the synonym to, is it the synonym, the fitness can it be a synonym or the generational effect? I'm having trouble with the... Can the fitness be a synonym to intergenerational equity. Intergenerational equity. Yes, that is intergenerational equity, meaning that while you are living today, you need to be in consideration of those who live after that. Oh, okay. So is, is fitness, should fitness be used as a justification for yes. thinking about future generations and like conserving resources for future generations? Um, if we decided to start making policy decisions based on maximizing our fitness, I think a lot of bad things would happen. But I think in, in this case, I think it would actually make sense to say, yes, if you deplete the resources, if you create a planet that um, your future offspring and other people's future offspring can't inhabit, then you're going to have very, very low fitness in the long run. And so is everybody else. But, yeah. Okay, so now Emily is going to tell you about how these things evolve a little bit. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? You can hear? Louder? Or is it good? Um, it is on. Should I just use it? Okay, how's this? Okay. Oops. Okay, um, I'm Emily Kay. I'm also a graduate student in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, like Alexis and um, Emily Jacobs Palmer. Um, so I'm going to talk. Alexis talked a lot about um, how different mating systems arise, or, or talked about these four different categories. I'm going to talk a little bit about how do they arise. Bateman had these results that female, males and females had different um, sort of relationships between the number of mates that they have and the offspring that they have. Um, so when we think about this in terms of mating systems, anything, we will kind of want to understand what factors create these kinds of relationships versus factors that create these kinds of relationships. So this would be something more like um, promiscuity, where both males and females would probably want to get as many mates as possible. Um, there are two factors that we can think about um, in terms of mating systems that we think are really important. So um, the first being environment and resources. So what, how does your environment affect what type of mating system you're going to have? Is it, are you able to have more than one mate, or are resources so scarce you um, can't be out getting more mates? Also, it's important to think about parental care. So is it OK to have one parent stay at home, or do you really need the efforts of both parents together, as in the case of monogamy? 
Um, I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about polygyny because this is the most common mating system. I'll talk a little bit about monogamy and a little bit about polyandry, and I'll close talking about promiscuity, but Emily will talk a lot more about promiscuity and its consequences in the third section of our talk. Um, in polygyny, males um, can sometimes dominate females, and so this is going to be an important component of the mating system, but females are always left at home providing the care. So to kind of um, graphically show how this can have an effect on the mating system, I want to talk about two different fake populations with data I've created from a hundred a population of a hundred individuals. So on the um, x-axis I'm showing the number of mates per male. So this ranges from zero to six in this population. And on the y-axis I'm showing how many males fall into each category. So in the monogamous mating system where every male has one female and every female mates with one male, everyone's a winner, everyone gets a mate. So you can see in this category it's a hundred um, and males have one mate. But in this kind of category, in a polygynous mating system where males can sometimes have more than one mate, but every female still mates with one, by necessity, some males are going to have more and some males are going to have none. So you can see there's a lot more um, mates in this category where um, males have zero and then a lot more that have um, more mates, like four or five or six. So there's a lot more variation in a polygynous mating system. And there's going to be intense competition in this kind of system for who gets the mates because any trait that a male could evolve that would make it sort of fall in this category and not be a zero would be useful. So what are some of the ways that males will try to compete with each other for access to females? Um, the first is categories through male-male competition. So males can actually just try to beat up on each other and the winner takes all, like in the case of the elephant seal that Alexis was telling you about. The second set of categories are just sort of be so irresistible to a female, be so sexy that females are throwing themselves at you and you can get more mates by being just purely attractive. <laughs> so if you're going to compete, perhaps the simplest sort of system is just compete for actual females. So females clump together either because they're trying to avoid predators, like you would imagine on savannah as a lot of um, animals will herd together, or in um, elephant seals where females always continue to go to the same beach from year to year, you're going to find um, strong competition for males who are going to try to get access to those females. So you can sort of think of it as like an arms race where um, any kind of trait that males can evolve that will make them better, like claws or antlers, um, will um, be a good kind of weapon to have. But you don't always have to fight over the females themselves. You can sometimes fight over different resources that females need that are essential to their reproduction. My favorite example of this is um, the orange rump honey guys. These birds live in the mountains of Asia and they require beeswax as an essential part of their diet. So males don't contribute any parental care, they don't contribute to the nest or defending a territory around the nest. Instead, they spend the whole year trying to maintain a breeding or a territory around these sites where there are these beehives. So males, by defending these beehives, will sort of have the best real estate and any female that comes through, they can sort of try to meet with. The third um, sort of scenario is where males, um, females don't really care, they just want to mate with a proven male, and they'll try to meet with whatever male is on top. So um, we can think of baboons that do this a lot. So males will just sort of try to fight among each other for establishing um, a dominance hierarchy, and then um, females will mate with the best one. But that's not always to say you have to be strong and having weapons to succeed. You can also sneak around. So um, in this example on the upper left, I'm showing three salmon. The top, they're all males. The top two are sort of like your regular dominant large males. And what they'll do in the system is female, they'll try to pair up with a female and follow her through um, around. And when she sort of builds her nest, he'll be there, fending off all other males who are trying to meet with her. And then when she's ready to lay her eggs, he'll um, deposit his sperm and fertilize them. But you can notice that this small male on the bottom is also a male. He's a, called a jack in this um, system. And what he'll do is sort of lurk around in the shadows. And when the big dominant male isn't paying attention, he'll swoop in, grab the sperm bomb, and head up. <laughs> so he can still do pretty well this way. But my favorite example, so gobies will do the same thing. But my favorite example of this is actually the one on the bottom. These are cuttlefish. These are cephalopods, and they have this incredible um, camouflage behavior where they'll try to blend into their environment or blend in away from predators. And so what you can see here is the female is on the left and the male is on the right and he's sort of showing two different patterns. On the left he's trying to show the female his male side and on the right he's trying to show other males who might be looking on and guarding this female. He's trying to blend in and look like a female. 
So I think this is a pretty clever tactic, so he can sort of cozy on in and sneak up closer to this female. But um, these are all male competition strategies, but females will also, you know, what, what do, how are they sort of responding to this? Um, females stand a lot to lose in some sense. It takes a lot of energy to make an egg, and sometimes you have to care for the young whether you choose to or not. So if you win, you know, you're pregnant for nine months, that means you're, you're out of the dating pool at this time. Um, so females really don't do better, like Bateman found, with more mates. They should probably instead just choose quality, not quantity. So how should females be choosing mates in these kinds of systems where males are competing so strongly for them? One way is to just choose males that give you stuff, that give you material goods that um, help out and improve your ability to leave offspring. So let's say you're a single female, you might look for males who provide you things like food, a home, maybe some health care, maybe more than one home. Um, so pretty much anything that allows you to go from being an individual that has just a few offspring, sort of any material goods you can get from your mate that will allow you to be in a scenario where you can leave more offspring will be sort of selected for, and those males will do better. But that's not to say females are totally materialistic. Females also care sort of about the quality, the genetic quality of their mate. They want to make sure he's healthy. So there's the good genes hypothesis saying that females are also maybe looking for a little bit more in a mate. They want to make sure that they mate with a male who has um, sort of like healthy genetic background and that when he mates, um, or that what the female would mate with by mating with this male would have good offspring herself. So let's say you're a female and um, on the left of the, if this female were to mate with a sort of sicklier male, she might have some offspring who might get sick um, and only have to leave two grandchildren. Whereas if the female on the right were to mate with sort of a really strong fit male, let's say the Usain Bolt of our society, her offspring would guarantee to be strong and fit and would probably survive and do well. A similar related hypothesis or why females might be choosing mates would be the sexy sons hypothesis. And this is sort of as simple as it sounds. You mate with a male who's just purely attractive, with the idea being that if your sons inherit some of that attractiveness, they too will also go on to get mates. So if a female were to mate with McDreamy, hopefully she would produce little McDreamies who would then go on and get mates without a problem. So these are some of the ways that we think about um, female choice and sort of how females are choosing among males. And um, we, when we see these kinds of crazy traits, we, they're not weapons. They're not directly useful for competition. In fact, they're really big and sort of screaming, like, hey, look at me. This would be maybe good if you're trying to attract a female, but maybe terrible if you're trying to avoid a predator. So what are these traits? Are they really driven by sort of female choices and preferences for them? And just sort of putting together this presentation, I thought that the peacock was so mesmerizing, even as a human. So I think it would probably work. But we can test this. Um, and so in one of my favorite experiments done in 1982 by Malty Anderson, who went out and looked at whether these long tails that you see in males here, which can get up to half a meter long, um, if they were actually doing anything useful for the male. Females, just by contrast, have a seven centimeter tail, and they're small and brown. So this is really a long tail, and when you see these fly, they sort of, it waves through the air, it sort of draws a lot of attention in the grassland habitat that they live in. So if these tails really are useful, you can look, um, you can sort of make a prediction that males with really long tails are going to do better than males with short tails. So to test this, Malty Anderson went out and he created four different sort of experimental groups. And the first, he just took a group of males and cut their tails down to shorten them to 30 centimeters. He then took those feathers and glued them on to other males to elongate their tails down to 75. But as every good experimental um, biologist knows, you also need to have a control group. So maybe just cutting the tails um, would stress a bird out, or maybe having something glued on to you would stress it out and change the behavior. To make sure this was an important factor, as a controlled group, he um, took some males and just cut their tails and then re-glued them back on to see if that wasn't having an effect. And finally, he left um, one set of males untouched to see how that, they would fare. And as his measure of fitness, he would count the number of nests that males had before and after the treatment to see does, um, how, how the effective tail would matter. And what he finds is, yeah, males with long tails do a lot better. So I'll walk you through this um, graph. On the bottom x-axis, we're showing different treatment groups. And on the y-axis, we're showing the number of um, nests per male. 
what you can see is these two guys in the middle, the control groups, um, either the male who had his tail cut and re-glued on or the other one that was left untouched, they get on average about one nest per male. Um, even the guys who are shortened, they maybe decrease a little, but they're all kind of on the low end. But you definitely see a strong increase in the number of males, um, nests that a male has because of his long tail. And we can sort of say we think it really is because of the long tail because we've done the proper controls. So this suggests that females really are choosing these crazy long elaborate um, traits like long tails or maybe bright colors. So in the polygynous mating system, where females have this sort of relationship where they flatten out, where they don't get more offspring with more mates, they really should be choosing based on quality, sorry, not quantity. And you can do that through sort of what you get or sort of the genetic benefit. And males are always trying to get more and usually through competing with each other or trying to impress a female. Um, before I go on and talk about monogamy and polyandry, are there other questions about what I've said so far? I have a question. Since, from what it seems like, the male like um, make more babies and females don't, does it kind of imply that um, that the male gets more of the trait pass on compared to female? Because they have so many babies, they have like okay, they have like a blue trait, like, and then they pass it on to like eight hundred something kids, while the female only have that one trait pass on to like six to nine kids. I don't know. It's more. It, what, what's going to happen is so every offspring has two parents, so they're going to be genes from the females representing. If she has 800 kids, um, she'll have 800 offspring as well. What will happen is there'll be, remember the graph where I showed you, there's a huge variation in the number of mates that a male got. Um, the, what the male sort of genes in the pool are going to be slightly biased towards the males that are sort of leaving more offspring. So. Males that have a lot more offspring, those genes will be at a higher frequency in the population later compared to other males' genes. So you can sort of get sort of um, some genes that might code for blue coloration sort of could fix in a population quickly if every female wants to mate with a blue male. But every offspring did have two parents. Any other questions? Uh-huh. Is it uh, sort of a strange question? Is it about the individual or is it about the species and the genetic of the species? Okay, so the question was, is it about the individual or about the genetics, um, sort of like the greater good for the species? And it, I always think about everything on sort of the individual level. So a male wants to do what's best for him. He's going to be selfish and he doesn't care um, how the female fares in some sense as long as he has more offspring. Um, and females are trying to sort of protect the resources that they have. Um, but there can be sort of conflicts that um, Emily will tell you a little bit more about in hers. Um, but I think you can sort of take a lot of these arguments about like something that seems cooperative and you can break it down to a sort of individual level benefits. So everything has to be benefiting that individual or it should not be present or be selected against. Okay. I'm going to move on and start talking about a little bit about monogamy and polyandry. But these are really uncommon um, overall in, in nature. Um, so in monogamy, oftentimes resources are scarce, and really you, it's driven in large part by having to have both parents cooperate together to provide parental care. So environment can kind of drive males to be stay-at-home dads for a couple of reasons. If food is scarce, it might not be enough to have one female provide all the care. If she needs a lot of food for her offspring, and it's hard to go out and get it. Imagine birds feeding a nest. Um, it, it won't help a male in terms of his fitness if he has an offspring and then leaves for a while. There can also be great risks of predation, so maybe doing all these flashy courtship displays puts you at risk as a male, so maybe it's better to just sort of get your mate and stick with her. Or um, maybe offspring that you've already had are jeopardized if you're out sort of gallivanting around trying to pursue and get more mates. So in these types of situations, a male's best strategy might be to actually be a stay-at-home dad. Sometimes the offspring themselves can be a little needy, so if offspring take a long time to develop. They might need sort of, or wean, so um, if they're not sort of precocial right away, if sort of eggs hatch or young are born, and they need more attention before they're a mature adult able to function on itself, um, both parents might have to invest more in their offspring longer. Also, you might, in the case of Clark's Reeves, get better cooperation if you have a really strong pair bond. So maybe by having a pair bond, you're going to produce more offspring together as a couple than having several multiple mates that you're not as familiar with. 
So again, the best strategy in these types of situations might be to be a stay-at-home dad. And sometimes males maybe want to get extra mates if they're trying to decide, pursue more females or stay with the one I have, but it just might not be possible if females mate synchronous or come into estrus synchronously. So if um, females are all sexually receptive at the same time, that doesn't leave a male a lot of opportunity to mate with one and go find another. So sometimes even the female's biology might prohibit a male from having multiple mates. So just sort of to, in the um, monogamous relationships, both males and females have kind of the same relationship where they're not getting um, more offspring with more um, additional mates. And that's often driven by um, things like high predation and the need for both parents to invest. Polyandry, I think, is the most bizarre and rare system. And it really, you only find it in a few sea animals and a couple um, birds. These are shorebirds, all chagriformes. So it's all one order of birds, and these birds are unique in the sense that males provide a lot of care. So in polyandry, males provide the care, and there's a high level of predation. These two things together really do explain why you get these weird systems where males are staying at home and females aren't. So when there's a lot of predation, it doesn't do either the male or the female very good. So if they're both um, losing eggs, just no one's getting an advantage. Um, and males, maybe they would like to have more offspring, but they're limited by a female's ability to produce eggs. And so in birds, this takes a lot of energy and food and resources and nutrients to produce an egg. So in this kind of situation, if a male can stay home and sort of protect the offspring and lets the female go out and forage, she'll do better because she can have nutrients to relay eggs and the male can sort of guard what he already has. <laughs> so this works out well only if males are stay-at-home dads. So. Just posing to the audience a question, you know, imagine if females didn't get pregnant and said males did, and all you did was you gave a male your egg and he sort of took it, took care of it, provided all the care. That might change your, your behavior and the number of mates that you might want. So in these um, polyandrous um, species, Alexa already talked a little bit about this leafy sea dragon, but also in the seahorse you can see his young sort of sticking their heads out of its pouch, and here a bird male bird um, guarding it. In these cases, a lot of it's driven by males providing care. Um, this is just some nice data from the northern Dakana. It's a polyandrous bird. Um, so some researchers went out in Costa Rica and they looked at how the birds of both sexes were changed, spending their time. So just with a pair of binoculars, you track a bunch of birds, males and females, and just record what they're doing. You can come up with like a time budget to get an idea of how they're spending their time. And so on the x-axis here from left to right, it's showing reproductive condition for males on the left column and females on the right. And what you can see is as you go from pre-copulatory all the way to having chip, if you start at the bottom, interspecific aggression really only comes on once there are eggs or chicks around. And females, if anything, maybe seem to be slightly more aggressive. But females provide no incubation at all. Males do all the incubating. Males also spend almost all their time brooding while females provide nothing. And males will also stick around with the offspring once they're around, sort of guarding them. So males are really providing the parental care in the species. What are the females doing with all their free time? Well, females are out eating. That's what they're doing. Um, and so on this graph here, you can see that um, males on the left sort of actually reduce the amount of foraging that they're um, engaging in once they have chips, while females sort of stay relatively constant. And one thought is maybe it is better for the male if his partner is out getting food so that she's ready to lay eggs if they lose anything to have predation. And I think what's cool about this um, polyandrous mating system, while rare, is that you do also get sex role reversal um, in the sense that um, males are sort of providing parental care and females really want to have every additional male. So every male they can get to sit on their eggs is sort of another um, set of offspring that they can have. So females are limited by how many caretakers they're going to get. And once a female finds a good caretaker, she wants to keep them or keep them if she's able to get um, several of them. So females in this um, types of systems tend to be larger and more aggressive and more colorful like males were in the polygynous mating system. So it's this interesting reversal. And in this, this, these pictures of red phalaropes, female, the females on the right. So in polyandry, it's a reverse of the situation. Females always do better with more mates. So every mate they can convince to sit on their eggs, they do better, um, or sort of keep them in their pouch. Well, males, they can't, they're limited by having, they can't produce eggs themselves. So they have to sort of keep what they have when they get some. 
Um, before going to promiscuity, are there any questions about these kinds of systems? Um, could you simplify the meaning of a precocial? Precocial. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, when you say that's a precocious uh, teenager, Precocial means that when um, an egg hatches, the young are immediately able to run around, feed on their own. So um, this is really common in shorebirds because predation is so high. So from the moment they hatch, their parents could desert them and they're totally fine. Unlike human babies or mice or a lot of other types of animals where parents have to, once they hatch, parents have to continue feeding and investing them. And so the opposite of precocial is altricial. In relationship with precocious, as in relationship with precocious, it's, it's the same sort of root. No, no, it's a precocial. Precocial, sorry. Is, has it any relationship with precocious? Something done before the time, like the child developed precocious ahead of his age. Um, yeah, so is there a relationship between the word precocious and precocial? Um, precocial really in biology does mean sort of are you able to be fully functional from the moment you're born um, and not sort of about your development like we think of it in terms of humans. I mean, one and one okay, maybe, maybe let's talk after. Yeah, the break. Uh, yeah, the break's coming up. Okay, the last system is promiscuity. And just like the word, it sort of makes you think there are a lot of different ways you can be promiscuous. So I'm going to talk just about a few. Um, oftentimes you get promiscuity when the environment's super unpredictable or when you're living in a large social group. And I'll explain what I mean in a second. But oftentimes in these types of systems, Females are the ones who are providing care. So my favorite magnetic field song is, let's pretend we're bunny rabbits. And the next line is, and do it all day long. And it's because bunnies or rabbits um, really do mate promiscuously very frequently, very often. Um, so sometimes they live in these environments that are boom or bust. But when food is abundant, it's best to reproduce. And if the breeding season is long, females will try to mate with multiple partners and increase just sort of the total output of offspring she can have. Um, and oftentimes in promiscuous systems, maybe there's no advantage to the male providing care. So sticking around isn't going to do much. Um, um, so both will try to mate as much as possible. So you can imagine this in other types of systems um, where maybe mountain lions, for example, live um, and sort of whenever they run into each other, they'll mate and then they'll sort of part ways. And so you just mate whenever you find a, ma a male or female. But my favorite example of promiscuity is promiscuity that's not obviously promiscuity. So birds were long thought to be the poster child of monogamy. Um, people have said, yeah, 90% of birds are monogamous. And it's, there's a lot of variation in the monogamy. So you can have monogamy just for one nest cycle all the way up to your entire life. But it turns out with DNA um, fingerprinting and sort of you can do these paternity tests, we started finding out that actually Birds are just monogamous most of the time in a social sense, where they have a pair bond and they spend time together, but they're not reproductively so. In fact, 90% of bird species actually have some kind of cheating, which I think is just astounding. Um, and this can vary from just one or few individuals are get seeking extra pair populations to 80% of the individuals in the population are mating with other individuals. So you can get this kind of scenario where you have a female who's paired up with a male. Maybe you need a strong social bond to defend a territory and collect food. Sort of for the reasons that monogamy is useful, you need two partners. But for the reasons that females also like um, sexy males or males with good genes, females might also be interested in neighboring males. So um, sometimes you find when you genotype the offspring, you can sort of say, what is, who's the father? And you find out you have these mixed paternity pairs. But why would females want to be mating multiple times? There are a couple advantages. Some of them I've already talked about. So indirect benefits, if, you, if a female gives you food every time you meet, um, it's going to be better for you maybe to have more mates. Um, you can also hedge your bets against a sterile partner. So if your partner isn't always um, successful at sarin offspring, maybe you can sort of do it with more males. Um, you can avoid inverting. So if you live in large social groups and your neighbors or people in your community are, or um, other individuals in your community are likely to be related, it might actually be better to mate with many, many individuals because some of those might not be related. Um, females might also um, want to mate with males who have good genes or seem very attractive. Or maybe it's best just to sort of have um, a, a diverse genetic offspring. 
Um, so if the environment's changing a lot, maybe you meet with a lot of different males, have a lot of different kinds of kids, and some of those will hopefully make it. I want to talk just um, about inbreeding avoidance as my sort of last experiment um, that I think is really interesting. But it's interesting that you find a lot of promiscuity in systems that live in social groups. So when a bunch of individuals live together in colonies or share burrows or kind of cooperate together, it's likely that some of them are um, related. So it seems better to try to mate with lots of different individuals. And in these cavies, these are um, wild cavies from um, Peru, what you find is that females and males will just mate almost randomly with anyone they find. <clears throat> And so um, you can start to ask questions like, does inbreeding avoidance actually really promote this promiscuous type of behavior in females? And so this experiment that just came out in science last year, I think it's super cool. They, um, researchers created two different kinds of um, red flower beetles. So they grow in flower, they're easy to keep in the lab. And they created two different strains. So they took males and females who are siblings to create inbred populations. They mated them to each other and sort of perpetuated these populations for 15 generations. So that means every time, you know, every so often, they'll take those um, flower beetles, put them to a new bag of flour, and sort of do that. And after 15 bags of flour, and it's gone through 15 generations, you can test what's going on in the population in these inbred lines and compare them to what's going on in these outbred lines. So to create these outbred lines, they took unrelated individuals, created populations from them, and just sort of perpetuated those for 15 generations. And at the end of this time, researchers took females and 10 males from their population, and they put them together in a jar and just watched the type of mating behavior that the female engaged in. What they, what they find is that females who are inbred were quicker to start copulating than um, outbred females. So they initiated much faster. They mated longer than females from outbred populations. And they also mated with many more males. Um, and if you compare this to other females in the inbred population who didn't wait with as many, their offspring um, didn't survive and they didn't have as many. So it seems like maybe um, when there's a lot of inbreeding going on in your population, it might be a pretty good strategy to just mate with lots of males because hopefully some of them aren't going to be related to you. Um, so in promiscuity, you can sort of, because of um, sort of the type of environment or because um, uh, you, you can sort of get these relationships where males and females will both do well together um, and have more uh, babies with increasing number of mates. And sometimes the best strategy is if you require parental care, sort of have a mixed strategy where you have one partner but then seek copulations on the side. So just to kind of summarize, I think environment and parental care do go a long way in explaining how you get different um, reproductive um, systems and interactions between males and females. And I think environment and parental care will kind of dictate when um, one sex does better and gets more mates and one sex um, actually should invest more in quality. So um, with that, I'm going to, uh, I guess we're going to break for the break. Oh, two questions before the break. Yes. Um, with the parts that are just socially monogamous, do we know if they know when their mates are cheating? Like, does that change how the males care for their eggs, not knowing if they're all theirs? Yeah, so the question is, um, males who are being cuckolded, um, do they know that they're being cuckolded, and why wouldn't they? So I think that's a really good question. If a male could detect when he was raising offspring that weren't his, and he was feeding them and defending them, he should desert <laughs> and move on. So they're not really able to tell. Um, and maybe that's part of the female strategy, too, is meet with her partner as well as other males. So the male doesn't, he knows that he's mated with his partner, but he doesn't know that she's mated with others. So it might be a good kind of cover-up strategy. But um, there should be a selection for the males to try to recognize. And you can see, um, yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, just like with a human animal, obviously, you can only be pregnant with one person's um, offspring at a time, but like with birds, are you saying they can be pregnant with several males' um, offspring? And how many other animals are like that, and is that related to the system that they choose? Yeah, so the question is that in humans, um, you usually only have one father uh, per offspring, um, but what's, one or one pregnancy, um, but what's going on with um, birds? And so um, birds will often have multiple eggs. And it takes them, they can only really, most birds only lay one egg a day. So they have to sort of keep the sperm around for a longer time. So females actually have um, reproductive tracts that store sperm. 
So if a female mates with five males in five days, she's going to have still five male sperm available to her. So by the time she decides to fertilize that egg, it could be a different male sperm. Can any mammals do that, or is it just birds with a fish and the lizards and stuff? Yeah, and fish oftentimes it's external fertilization, so everything happens out. And so you could have a nest where many males are dumping sperm on it. So um, it, can, it can happen in fish. Um, Stay tuned. <laughs> and stay tuned for the next talk. Uh, I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to take a break now, um, but I'm happy to ask que answer questions. Okay. Okay, so we're going to take a short break for about five to eight minutes. During that break, you're welcome to go get some more refreshments or use the restroom or come down front. And all three of our speakers will be up here to answer any individual questions you have that might not, you might not have had a chance to answer. Uh, before I release you, I do want to give a few quick reminders. First off, everyone should have a survey. If you do not have a survey, you should pick it up up front here and make sure to hand it in at the end of the third part. We use these surveys to both provide feedback to the speakers, but also to provide information for our organization and for the people who fund us about the number of people here, what you think. So if you don't hand in a survey, you're kind of hurting us there. So make sure you hand that in. And also, we have full schedules of the entire series up front. So grab one of these on your way out as well. It has the full schedule up here, and you can hang it on your fridge so you don't forget any. And finally, before you leave, and I'll remind you this again, make sure to leave us your email address on the survey if you want to hear more about our events. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, do whatever you do on Google Plus, Plus One Us. Um, share, share this with all your friends because we'd love to see some new faces each week. OK, we'll see you back here in about five minutes.
Okay, this is the two minute warning. It, we're going to start again in two minutes, so wrap up any questions going on up front. Find your seats. We'll get started again soon. Okay, while we wait for everyone to find their seats, uh, before I turn it over to Emily in number two for the final segment of tonight's lecture, I just want to remind you again to pick up a schedule. Next week, we have a very exciting lecture on a topic we've kind of stayed away from for quite a while, so we hope you'll all come out. The title is How Evolution Generates Endless Forms Most Beautiful, and that quote is from Darwin's uh, Origin of Species. And the lecturers are going to talk about 
kind of how evolution works, uh, how evolution goes in hand with development, and a certain example of human evolu recent human evolution. And I won't give away the punchline, but that final part's pretty good. So we hope to see you again next week. Please spread the word to your friends via whatever your favorite means of communication is, whether it is by phone, email, in person, Facebook, other social media. So we hope to see you again next week. Additionally, make sure to fill out your survey. We do provide feedback to all the speakers. So some of you already handed them in, but especially if you're still holding on to it, give any information that's specific to the third segment as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emily, who will give our third segment of tonight's talk. And then if you choose to stick around, there will be a demonstration afterwards where all three speakers will be down front showing you some examples of how they actually study this stuff in the lab. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, thanks for coming back from the break. I hope you got a chance to stretch your legs a little bit. Um, and um, I'm actually going to hopefully convince you that, believe it or not, um, mating system is important even after mating has already occurred. So I think that Alexis made it abundantly clear in her first lecture that there are a number of very different ways to get the job of reproduction done. Um, and then Emily gave you a really good idea of what kinds of competition and choice occur in the finding of a mate and the keeping of a mate. Um, what makes a good mate? Is it a good parent? Is it a good um, provider of gifts? Um, or is it good genes? But um, I'm actually going to take this to an even more intimate level. Um, and I'm going to start with an example that's very close to home. And um, actually, there was a very good setup for this at the end of the last talk. So does anyone here, raise your hand if you know what the term heteropaternal superfecundation means. OK. So let's walk through it. Um, hetero, different. Paternal, father. Super, extra. Fecund, fertile. So maybe this picture will give you a hint. Um, so this is something that happens very rarely in humans. It's when a woman gives birth to fraternal twins by multiple fathers. Um, so not very likely, but um, in the rare case that it does happen, how does this happen? This sounds pretty weird. Um, basically. Humans can, human females can store sperm in their reproductive tract for at least six days. And um, so that means that if you're a woman and you release two eggs in a given cycle, and you've slept with two men the week before, this is conceivable. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's a little scary. Um, but uh, the reason that I'm bringing up this example is that I want you to get out of the mode of thinking of the great sperm race as um, some sperm from one male um, racing towards the egg of a female and into the mode of something that's actually quite common in the animal kingdom, which is sperm from multiple males within a single female's reproductive tract racing for one or more eggs from mom. Um, so now that we've got that set up, how does this relate to what we've been talking about this whole time, mating systems? Well, for every um, situation or group of animals that Emily and Alexis talked about in the first part of this talk, um, where they were either promiscuous or polyandrous, um, this can actually occur, where you get um, the sperm from multiple males inside a female's reproductive tract. Or um, I think Emily um, and Alexis both talked about some examples, too, where it's, it's external, but this race is occurring um, for eggs. Um, and I'm going to begin by talking about the female side of this equation. So um, as I said, often this race occurs within a female tract. Um, and this may be surprising, but females can actually influence the outcome of this competition among sperm from different males. And there are sort of a couple broad categories of influence. The first, I put up a picture of a castle. This is the idea of a fortification, that a female is going to put up a barrier towards fertilization of her eggs. Um, and, um, right, so uh, why would you want to do this? Like, you've already made it with these guys. Um, why would you want to put up a barrier to the fertilization of your eggs? Females don't always get to choose who they mate with. So in cases of forced copulation, um, there might be an instance in which a, a, a female would want to keep um, sperm away from 
the site of fertilization. And speaking of science in the news, I just want to make something abundantly clear. There was a recent statement made um, by Todd Aiken that um, in cases of legitimate rape, females are capable, human females are capable of um, not of shutting down, shutting that whole thing down, I believe is what he said. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is essentially true for a very limited number of species. I'm going to give you an example in a moment. But I study this, and if there were a shred of evidence indicating that this could actually happen in humans, I would know about it, and there is not. <laughs> so moving on. <laughs> um, in addition to sort of building uh, fortifications, humans have ways of just creating something a little subtler, an obstacle course for the sperm of multiple males in her tract. Now, um, so this kind of obstacle course might weed out the strongest and the fastest sperm from the pokey and slow ones. But again, why do you care if your eggs are fertilized by strong and fast sperm rather than pokey and slow ones as long as they get the job done? Um, this is sort of analogous to the sexy sons principle that Emily talked about in the um, first part of the lecture. So you can imagine that if you're a female and you've been inseminated by a male with super fast sperm and a male with super slow sperm, and you create this obstacle course that weeds out the slow sperm, your eggs are going to be fertilized by the super fast sperm. You're maybe going to have sons in about half of the cases. And those sons are then potentially going to inherit their father's sperm traits and go on to win in similar competitions than other females when they have their own offspring. And so this is the kind of intergenerational fitness consequence that um, both Emily and Alexis discussed in the first half of the talk. Um, so I am going to now give you some more specific examples. And I'll start with this, this fortification kind of issue. So how many of you here know what a mallard duck is? Have you seen a mallard duck? Guys with the green heads, nice ducks, um, all over the place. But um, what you might not know about these guys is that they actually are not monogamous. They do form pair bonds, and you often see them swimming around in those pair bonds. And um, the females get to exert um, some degree of mate choice, um, like Emily talked about. But um, there's something else that happens in this species, which is that um, outside of pair bonds, males will often force females to mate. Um, so what you may not have noticed is that there's actually a female in this picture. Um, and that's what's happening here. And, and females actually occasionally drown in mallards and other duck species where this happens. So this has a variety of consequences, some of them more graphic than others. Um, so this is a male um, Argentinian duck. And frequently in species where this kind of behavior is most intense, the uh, duck's penis ends up actually being longer than its body. Um, so <laughs> that, that's what's going on there. Um, and the way that duck penises work, um, just to give you a little background, is that they're sort of all tucked up inside the male body. And then when the moment comes, um, they actually evert, so they kind of turn inside out. And um, it just so happens that a corkscrew shape is really good for um, this <laughs> particular act. <laughs> um, but <laughs> you may be wondering, are females defenseless? No, they're not. I probably wouldn't be talking about it if they were. Um, <clears throat> males have corkscrew-shaped um, penises, but female reproductive tracts are actually corkscrewed as well in the opposite direction. So let me get you oriented here. Um, what you're seeing in the top right-hand corner is um, the penis of a mallard duck. And what you're seeing down here is the female tract. So here is the entrance to the female tract. And these guys right here are actually blind end pouches. They're places where the female can shunt sperm if she's being inseminated by a male with whom she did not choose to copulate. And then up here is closer to the site of fertilization. And this is where the real corkscrew starts in the opposite direction. Now you may be wondering, well, what happens when she kind of when she is in a pair bond when she is consenting? Well, when she is consenting, um, she can essentially relax the musculature around her tract and allow um, the males to deposit their sperm in a place where they will fertilize her eggs. Um, but if she is not, um, in the case of these extra pair copulations, she does have um, some ability to exert control over whether or not she gets fertilized. Um, yeah, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on now to an example, actually, from my own work from two species that I study. Um, these guys are pretty cute, right? 
Um, they are um, two very closely related species of mice. They're wild mice, so they're not the same as lab mice. Um, this one is monogamous, um, and it's called the old field mouse on the left, and on the right is the promiscuous deer mouse. Now, um, the old field mouse, they form pair bonds, they exhibit paternal care, which you might expect from hearing Emily's portion of the lecture. And um, these guys on the right do nothing of a sort. Um, so females come into estrus for one night every five nights. And um, females uh, and males will both sleep around, so to speak. Um, and the females actually have been known to mate with multiple males in like five or 10 minutes. So um, <laughs> they often in the wild, if you do this paternity testing that both Alexis and Emily have mentioned, um, you see uh, females giving birth to litters that have two or three different fathers. And given that their litters are typically around only like six or seven pups, <laughs> that's like, that's quite a lot of getting around. Um, so uh, I had a hypothesis uh, based on these two species that in the monogamous species where females only have sperm from one male in their reproductive tract, there isn't really that much point in creating an obstacle course. And especially, you know, if your male happens to be slightly less fertile, you actually, you want those sperm to get to the eggs. But if you are um, a female that's, that's being mated by multiple males um, and you want to sort of separate out the thoroughbreds from the Shetland ponies in the sperm world, you might want to have a more kind of complicated tract. So I looked at these tracts. I looked at the oviducts, which are essentially analogous to the human fallopian tube. So the eggs travel through them, and they are where the sperm um, fertilize. And in the monogamous species, you can see there's a few twists and turns. Um, but on the whole, this is not a bad um, racetrack to have to run if you're a sperm. But um, in the promiscuous species, which again is about the same size, and they're extremely close relatives. These two are actually still interfertile, even though they never encounter each other in the wild. So they're good species, but um, they're very closely related. And you can see that um, in the promiscuous mouse, the oviduct is much more tortuous. So um, if you think that's bad, um, mammalian uh, female reproductive tracts are nothing compared to um, their counterparts in insects. So this, hmm, I almost want to hit the lights for a second here. OK. So um, this is um, the reproductive tract of, the, of a fruit fly, so the organism that Alexis introduced um, in the Bateman experiment, which she talked about initially. And it's very complicated. It has multiple sperm storage organs. And if you're a female fruit fly, you um, typically spend the majority of your adult life with sperm from multiple males in your tract. Um, and so I actually, um, this is from the work of a woman named Molly Meunier. She's a friend of mine. And she, um, she used sperm, uh, excuse me, she used um, two uh, different lines of fruit flies that actually had been engineered to have glowing sperm. So she had red and a male whose sperm glowed green. And she allowed those two males to both mate with a female. And then she examined the female tract. And then she did this many, many times at many different time points after fertilization. And she very carefully looked at pictures and video of these sperm within the tract. And you can see the sperm. Um, so in fact, they're much of what's illuminating the tract here. So the green ones and the red ones. And they're blurry here because they're actually streaming through the tract um, when this picture was taken. Um, and what she was able to show is that their distribution and movements within the tract are very much non-random. And it appears that the female is actually exerting control over um, where they're placed relative to her eggs. And she can actually eject sperm non-randomly from these two males. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point? Um, presentation. Oh. OK, I'm going to go all off again, and then I'm going to go presentation. But it's not working, sadly. How about that? OK, great. Um, any questions? Yeah? She's exerting control, mm -hmm. so to speak. Does she know? Yes. Yeah. Is she actively choosing <laughs> right. which one she's? So um, this is a very good question. I think the answer to it is probably, oh, I'm sorry. The, the question is, um, does the female actually know? Is this some sort of conscious control, or is it something that her body is kind of doing on its own? I think um, that's a really hard question to answer, um, especially in fruit flies. Um, <laughs> my guess is that, um, 
that, that in a lot of cases, this is, this is unconscious. Um, in the duck example, though, um, it's probably, it probably is a more conscious choice in the sense that this, this duck actually is, is aware of um, being forced into copulation outside of a pair bond, and there is a sort of stress response that's occurring that's changing her physiology. Whereas in the fruit fly, it's actually, there's this dance between males and females um, that I'm willing to sort of talk in greater depth about after, um, maybe after the presentation, that makes it very difficult to tell actually um, sort of um, which part is active for the female and which part is active for the male. Because as the, the female is sort of moving the sperm around her tract, the sperm are also moving themselves around her tract. So um, it gets complicated, I guess, is the answer to that question. <laughs> um, but, I'm, but I'm very happy to talk about it more. Um, OK, so. Um, you may, be, you may be thinking right now, like the situation seems pretty dire <laughs> for males, um, but I assure you that for every uh, fortification and obstacle uh, that females erect um, in um, the path of sperm, uh, there are strategies that um, males employ to overcome those fortifications and obstacles. And if a strategy um, gives a male advantage in fertilizing the eggs, it's going to rapidly spread throughout a population. Um, so uh, just to sort of get you guys warmed up, what have these males got? Um, this is a pretty neat example, I think. Um, this is a giant sperm, again from the fruit fly. The, the sort of um, literature on this sort of post-mating competition and choice is rife with fruit fly examples because they're just a great system to work with. Um, in this case, this is a particular species of fruit fly where the sperm are all coiled up, so you are looking at a sperm cell there. Um, it is 5.8 centimeters long. Now. That may not seem like much, <laughs> but it's about 20 times the length of the body of the male that has this sperm. So that's like a human sperm being about 120 feet long. That's like a 12-story <laughs> building sperm, <laughs> which is A, disgusting in some ways, but B, like really cool. <laughs> and <laughs> you may be wondering, why, why would you do this? Why would you have one, you know, or actually these males make a very small number of giant coiled up sperm. And what they do, it appears, is they actually, if, they, if they're mating second, they use these sperm to nudge out the sperm of the male that is before them. So they kind of can sidle their way into prime position within the female tract using these giant sperm. Um, yeah, so <laughs> you think that's crazy. Um, this may not look like much. Um, but this is a molecule um, that male fruit flies actually use to exert mind control over the females that they mate with. Um, so this is called sex peptide. Um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated but, but relatively compact molecule. Um, and um, sex peptide, along with a bunch of other closely related molecules, are present in the ejaculate of uh, fruit fly. Um, in, present in fruit fly ejaculates. And, and when this um, small protein gets into a female, it immediately enters her bloodstream and it goes to her brain and it has some neurological and behavioral effects. It convinces her that she's really not interested in any other fruit fly. She thinks this one is just fine. She's going to stop mating and she's also going to um, bring out all of the eggs for this one guy's sperm. So nuts. <laughs> um, and I'm very glad that <laughs> at least nothing this extreme happens in human beings, because that would be catastrophic. Um, so <laughs> but I'm going to end again with an example from the mice that I study, and I'm hoping to convince you that it's at least as interesting um, as uh, mind control in fruit flies. So uh, both the monogamous and promiscuous mice that I study do something really neat. Um, their sperm actually cooperate with each other. So what you're seeing in this picture is two sperm cells. Um, and usually it's actually more than, than two, and I'll show you a video in a second. Um, but uh, just for simplicity's sake, these guys um, stick their heads together. They have some sort of adhesion molecules on their heads. So they stick their heads together, their tails hang out the back. And um, we have shown quantitatively that when sperm do form these cooperative groups, the groups have, they exert more force. 
and they swim faster than sperm on their own. And this is actually a pretty, um, it's not uncommon at all, especially in rodent sperm, to have these cooperative groups forming. Um, so let me just show you a video of these guys. Um, so you can see the clumps are moving pretty quickly and, and, and pretty directionally. And it's also thought that possibly um, banding together like this gives you more force to avoid getting sort of stuck to the walls of the female tract. Um, a couple of big ones are about to come in from the side, I think, in a minute. Um, so um, we've done some work on these sperm clumps in my lab. And in particular, uh, there's a postdoc whose name is Heidi. Oh, here come the big ones. These are kind of the mother loads. Um, <laughs> so um, Heidi has done um, a fair amount of work with these clumps. And she asked a really interesting question. Um, so she was interested um, in the fact that in a promiscuous male who has, um, excuse me, a promiscuous species where females have um, sperm from multiple males in their tract at the same time, you can imagine that if you are a male sperm cell and you are trying to choose some buddies to cooperate with in the, in the race for the egg, um, you probably want to choose another sperm from the same male. Otherwise, you're going to be helping some other dude's sperm get to where you all want to be. So her hypothesis was that in the promiscuous species, sperm might actually be discriminating about who they clump with. They might only want to clump with other sperm from the same male. But in the monogamous species, sperm just kind of would never even consider the idea that there would be somebody else in the tract with them. So, and obviously, again, none of this is conscious. <laughs> um, but the point is that um, in the monog monogamous species, you might expect that sperm um, would be much less discriminating about who they clump and cooperate with. Now, does anybody have any idea how she might have tested this? Any ideas? I'm not sure I would have come up with this, so. Um, OK, she, she used a technique that we have seen before. Um, she dyed sperm from one male green and the other male red. Um, and then she mixed them together. And um, she did this first with the monogamous species. So indeed, when she mixed sperm from um, two monogamous males together, one dyed red and one dyed green, what she saw is that the clumps were on average about 50-50. So these sperm are really not showing any sort of discrimination in who they, who they cooperate with. Um, but in contrast, she did the same experiment with promiscuous males, and she noticed that the clumps were really much more skewed in one direction or another. So if you have a male with green sperm, and you mix them together really well with um, the sperm from another male labeled red, they don't go and form those 50-50 clumps. They really form much more skewed clumps. So this is evidence that they actually are discriminating in terms of their partners for cooperation. And, and Heidi is right now working on trying to get at the sort of molecular mechanism of this discrimination. So this is ongoing work, and we're really excited to find out because this is, this is it's not unbelievable because her experiments were good and her controls were good, um, but, it's, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to imagine the possibilities for how this might actually be mediated. Um, so um, now's another good time. Does anyone have any questions about this experiment or anything else that I've talked about so far? Right. Yes. What species is that? So um, these, are, um, these are back to my two species of mice. Um, so let's just go back. Um, so the monogamous ones are, are the field mouse that I mentioned before, and the promiscuous ones are the deer mouse that I mentioned previously. Yeah. Uh, OK. So. Um, oh, thank you. Um, sorry about that. I didn't mean to leave you guys in the dark. Um, so I'm just going to back out for a second and um, say that I, I really hope I've convinced you um, that mating system is important even after mating occurs. And especially in promiscuous and polyandrous species, when these competitions are occurring in the female tract and the female is exerting some sort of choice, there are really interesting evolutionary implications um, for um, new kind of reproductive structures and functions that are fascinating and come out of this uh, sperm, great sperm race. Um, so I think um, that in this talk, we've all been very careful to, um, when we were preparing ourselves, we really tried to leave nothing out. Um, but um, that's not always the case. Um, and uh, so I wanted to, to go back a little bit um, to the fact that this field of studying what happens after 
after me. Very new. It only picked up in about the 1970s, and most of the research is, is extremely recent. And I think that there are some social factors that can possibly account for this. So um, some scientific historians have postulated that Darwin um, may actually, he certainly had all of the information that he needed to figure out that this kind of choice and competition continues even after mating. Um, and he never, he never mentioned it in any of his works, and it's possible that that's just because this was the Victorian era. Um, there were certain things that you did not talk about, and Darwin also was already in a little bit of trouble, um, as you may know. So, or you certainly will hear about next week. Um, so um, that's one thing. But in addition, it's just this sort of interesting historical tidbit that his daughter, Eddie, was um, editing and translating a lot of the manuscripts that he was producing. So he sort of danced around this subject a couple of times, and it is conceivable that um, there's really this sense of family propriety um, in him not kind of fleshing out um, what might happen after mating. Um, but like I said, we've, we've really not been shy or shown any sort of propriety in this lecture that we've given you today. Um, so, um, but this leads us to the inevitable question. <laughs> What about humans? What about ourselves? Um, and and um, this, in some ways, is, is, can be difficult to talk and think about. Um, but I wanted to end the lecture with it um, and say that um, we really are, even though we're not monkeys, we're sort of the monkey in the middle in terms of our mating system. So our closest living relatives are chimpanzees, and they're highly promiscuous. So both males and females have multiple mates. Um, and our next distant cousins are gorillas, and in gorillas, Females will mate with a single male, but males will mate with multiple females. So this is the polygynous system that both Alexis and Emily stressed is very common in the animal kingdom. Um, but also, Emily gave you a really um, good idea, I think, of how much environment and um, especially uh, also the way that we raise our offspring and the development of our offspring matters a ton to mating systems. So I think in the case of humans, it's really not necessarily appropriate to look at our um, sort of nearest neighbors, our nearest family members in the animal kingdom to get an idea of what we do. Um, and, and this makes some sense given that we all know there's really a diversity of mating strategies within our own species. And there's also um, some levels of behavioral complexity and, and kind of cultural nuance that contribute to this in, in humans. So as biologists, we're here to kind of give you the facts, but certainly not to make value judgments. Um, so I um, want to end this talk by saying that if we've convinced you, all three of us, as a group of anything, I hope it's that um, there is this astonishing diversity of ways to get the job of reproduction done in the animal kingdom. Um, and um, additionally, any of these mating systems, promiscuity, monogamy, polyandry, polygyny, none of them will survive except for at the whim of natural selection. If the mating system that you're employing is not increasing your individual fitness, it will not survive in the long term. So stay tuned for more on that um, next week. As Tammy said, there will be a lecture on evolution, and I'm sure that they will go into much greater detail than we have um, on a lot of the co concepts that we've, that we've covered. Um, and yeah, we've had a great time. So thank you very much, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, we have some, there are definitely, I believe there are some primates that are monogamous. Yeah, there's certainly are primates that are monogamous. Yeah, they're a little bit more distantly related. Gibbons, sorry, gibbons are monogamous, so they're, they're a little bit farther out from us. Um, but again, you know, you see lots of mixing of mating systems when the environments and the um, development of organisms differ from each other. And, and sort of human biology is so, is, is different in such an extreme way <laughs> from the biology of our closest relatives that um, it's really not surprising that we don't do it like everyone else does <laughs> around us. <laughs> um, after mating, they can control the entrance of the sperm. Can they control the sex of the offspring? In, are you talking about the the any of these examples? Okay. Um, 
sorry, so the question is, um, after, you know, um, I've talked about some instances in which um, females can control the entrance of the sperm or who wins this race, and the question is, can they control also the sex of the offspring? Um, I believe there are certain cases where they can. It's not that common. Um, and also, the, the sex of offspring is, is determined in very different ways in different species. For example, um, in turtles, and collect, correct me if I'm wrong, Alexis, in turtles, um, the eggs get fertilized and then they lay them, and it's actually the temperature that determines whether they, they turn into males or females. So, because sex determination is really different in different species, um, uh, yeah, in, in some cases it happens long after fertilization. And I can't think of an example. There is that, there's a lizard example where it appears that when, <laughs> Alexis is there's rolling. A, there's a very uh, poor study where someone, uh, sorry. Okay, there, there is at least one study where someone suggested that females were using sperm from one male for, to create sons and sperm from another male to create daughters. That hasn't been replicated and it's considered highly controversial um, because it was based on a very small number of animals. Um, there's also evidence from turtles, which have this temperature-dependent sex determination, that females might make decisions about where to put their nests based on who they've mated with. So, so they may choose a warmer nest site if um, they want to create males. So, and this gets back to, yeah. so why would they want to create males based on this who they mated with? Um, the idea, I think, there is that when, um, Emily talked about sexy sons, when a female mates with a male that she thinks is super attractive, um, she might want to use his sperm to make male offspring because they may inherit some of his masculine hotness. <laughs> um, whereas um, if she uh, is mating with a male that has kind of overall good genes, she might um, want to turn them into not necessarily all male offspring. But again, like Alexa said, highly controversial. Sort of the theory is there, but um, the, the cases that we have, the examples that we have are uncertain because they haven't been replicated enough. Yes. Okay, oh, for example, okay. in red deer too, or in deer, where they, mm -hmm. the females, depending on their status yep. and their their group, and depending on the resources, they can produce males. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, can I add to that? Also? <laughs> Sorry. Um, there is someone else. Oh. I think you can probably just shout. Sorry. Right. There is actually also some limited evidence from humans that females in better condition are more likely to have sons than females in worse condition. Um, but again, this is a somewhat controversial <laughs> finding and subject to further research. Yep. Yes. Uh, just sort of something that was skirted around. Um, in, do we have a sense of nature of how much of sex is consensual? Um, yeah, so do we have a sense of nature of how much of sex is consensual? Um, we, we, we have a sense for cases that have been studied well. It's often a little bit difficult. So, so the mallard ducks is an obvious case where the, the female um, like actually incurs a substantial amount of damage and may even drown. So it's, it's pretty clear in that case that this is a non-consensual thing. Um, but you often get cases where sort of part of this testing of your mate in terms of their, you know, do they have good genes? Are they in good reproductive condition? Are they going to be around to help you provide? Involves asking them to, for example, run across the surface of the water. And, but maybe that takes the form of them chasing you. And so, like, this consensual thing, like, I just, I'm going to be totally frank with you. It gets really difficult. And without, um, without being able to get into the, the mind of an animal, if it has one, <laughs> which is you know, true for most of the animals we've been discussing, but um, it, just, it just gets difficult to, to tell. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, during, mate, during mating, uh -huh. does the female animals feel the burning of the sperm like in mankind? Do they feel the... Is it known? Is it known whether the female animals feel the burning of the sperm? Feel the, I'm sorry, there's one word that I don't understand. Feel the, the bond? The female animals the of the oh, do they do they feel that, like the the so the movement of the sperm? Um, I don't I don't know the answer to that question. Again, it's it's hard to tell what females kind of feel and don't feel without being able to get into their 
but um, but they certainly have um, responses to the males, um, like in the case of the mallard ducks. Again, you know that that's the kind of thing where you could you could measure a female's response to the male himself, but but knowing at that level of detail is is difficult. Yeah. Um, you one more. Yeah, it looks like people are. <laughs> Okay, so thank you all for coming. Give a round of applause for our speakers, Alexis, Emily, and Emily. We hope we'll see you all again next week, same time, same place. We do know that it is the first presidential debate next week, but we hope that our seminar on what might actually play into a policy debate will be a good preview for that. So please grab a schedule, hand in your survey, and if you'd like to stick around for about 15, 20 minutes, our speakers are staying to show you some of how they do their research and how they get their data. So see you next week. Thank you.